Whether you like or dislike, well, that's just your opinion, man. Welcome to a brand new episode of Movies and Me, and today I've got one of the spiciest guests that I've ever had on Movies and Me, one of my really good friends and fellow Tough Family guy. Please welcome to the show, Mr. Joe Davis. How you doing, buddy? Not bad. How you doing, man? Uh, pretty good. Uh, I'm really stoked to talk about this, because uh, as you know, I had never seen The Big Lebowski until you picked it as your episode, so... I gotta know, man. What is it that made you choose the Big Lebowski for this show? Oh man, it's well. Overall, it's one of my all-time favorite films. Uh, easily top three for me. Um, it's something that I was introduced to by my lovely wife, uh, who I believe you're having on the show as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think my love for it grew really quickly. And as weird as it sounds, there's a slight ethos in it that I use for my life, uh, and it's just taking it easy and just kind of, you know, going with the flow of things. But all in all, uh, it's a movie that every time I've watched it, I'll notice something different, or I'll, I'll have a sudden realization about this film that uh, that just makes me love it even more. Oh, that's great, because uh, when I first started watching this, it's, it's something about the Coens, really. You can tell they have such a passion for storytelling, and... Usually I hate voiceovers in movies, but the way they do this, it sets up who the main character is perfectly. It sets up what's going to happen in the story perfectly. So is there any like um, moments or scenes or characters or any part that you can bring up that you particularly love? I really like any time. Like there's a couple of scenes in the movie where the dude is really kind of embracing his whole like the detective aspects of this film. Uh, when he's dealing with Jackie Treehorn, when he's talking to Maud, there's there's little aspects. Eva starts calling it a case at one point, and it's like he's never portrayed himself as a detective before. But uh, when he's trying to negotiate with Jackie Treehorn, and Jackie Treehorn like goes off to deal with some like personal issues or some business issue that's popped up, and he runs over to try and like actually get like clues because he he's a smart dude. The dude is like. He abides and he chills and he's, he seems like he's a pretty simple guy, but he's not an idiot. He's actually surprisingly sharp. Um, and he starts scribbling on a notepad to try and uh, figure out by the impressions of the previous note what Jackie Treehorn had written. And all he had drawn was like the weird arctic and, and it was just, it, it's one of those little moments that made me love it. I also really enjoyed uh, his... Uh, interactions with the sheriff of Malibu or chief of police of Malibu uh, threw a cup at his head and he called it freaking fascist and all sorts of fun stuff like that. I, it's just this whole movie as a whole, I can't I can't let go of any aspect. Finding one particular part that I love is really difficult. Well, uh, one thing I noticed was the way that there's attention not just to the dude but to each character. Like Each one has a simple but really well-executed personality. Uh, John Goodman, for example, he's this Vietnam War-era guy that likes to, like, shout out stuff, and he really wants to make sure his voice is heard, but there's a nice little contrast with Steve Buscemi's character, Donnie, who he's always quick to tell to shut up, and you gotta feel bad for Donnie in this movie, and I've never seen Steve Buscemi do a role like that. Yeah, that's true. He's usually kind of more of a, like, sleazy, boisterous type. Uh, going to Walter for a second, it's really interesting because Walter is probably one of the most dynamic characters in the film, as odd as that sounds. Because we have a couple of parallels that they they uh, they contribute or they show pretty quickly uh, between like the the big Lebowski, uh, Jeffrey Lebowski, uh, yeah, the millionaire Jeffrey Lebowski, as Walter calls him, uh, and uh, where at one point when the dude's talking to him, he talks about uh, being in Korea. And he makes the comment that some, my, I lost my legs in Korea. Some Chinamen took them from me in Korea. Which in that statement alone, he, he shows that he doesn't really understand the differences between the, the Asian ethnicities and nationalities and everything. And he's just like this, this super old stereotypical racist dude. But in contrast, we have Walter who fought in Vietnam and obsesses about his time in Vietnam. But he's very sensitive to when the dude calls uh, the the guy one of the two rug peers uh, Chinaman, uh, dude, the uh, Walter's like, hey, dude, uh, Chinaman is not the preferred nomenclature. Asian American, please, because he's he's more sensitive to the differences in, in like different cultures, ethnicities, and the fact that he's like he's an American. Well, dude, call him an American. 
So. Yeah, and uh, there's another aspect here that I wasn't really surprised what, with. Well, it's, well, I was surprised with it. It's the way it's kind of, it kind of blends together comedy and kind of a way detective noir style, like with the whole detective side of it and having like femme fatale characters in there. You see that a lot with uh, the the actress that the Maud. dude meets a lot, Maud, yeah. And uh, uh, Julie, Julianne Moore. Julianne Moore, yeah, that's the one who played her. And to a certain extent, the um, Mr. Lebowski's wife and... And I don't know what it is about Mr. Lebowski, but the fact that they share the same name and that's kind of a recurring theme, but they're so completely opposite from one another was a really cool stylistic yep. choice for me. Yep. Um, and uh, I really enjoyed the fact that every time it was brought up, there were they used like de- defining words. Like uh, uh, Walter called him the millionaire Jeffrey Lebowski or uh, the... The dude refers to him as the Big Lebowski at one point, and um, and uh, I want to say even Jackie Treehorn's thugs uh, refer to the dude as the deadbeat Lebowski or the you know the the poor Lebowski and uh, all that jazz. And if I could take a moment for some really fun characters that kind of had almost no dramatic flow in this film, but they were used pretty accurate or effectively were the nihilists, the three the three nihilists that were. Just every time you saw them, they were ridiculous. Everything about them was ridiculous. When they're when they show up to be threatening, they show up in like the '90s equivalent of like hoodies, European hoodies, and they show up with a marmot that they throw in the dude's bathtub and a cricket bat to beat down his answering machine. There's just it's not. It, it's surprising how like weird they are, and it's still effective. When they show up to threaten them at the end of the film, one of them has a freaking saber, a saber. Like, who shows up to intimidate someone with an old World War One or a, uh, a Civil War or a saber? Well, it's those specific choices that I think make the Coen brothers stand out when they write their characters. We know that the Coens are very good at coming up with really quotable characters. So, I know Big Lebowski has a lot of quotable moments, but could you bring up any that, are, that stand out to you? Oh, man. Um, well, I've already mentioned one with Walter... A lot of them are Walter quotes, I kind of realized, that, you know, uh, does anyone around here give a fuck about the rules, or, or no, am I the only one around here who gives a fuck about the rules? Uh, and then Walter brandishing a gun in the same scene as, as Smokey telling him to mark at zero. Uh, oh, man. Oh, there's so many random parts, and now that I'm trying to think of them, I draw a blank, but I can quote it in my daily life. <laughs> Thanks, man. You put me on the spot, Nolan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, the, after uh, Lebowski and Maude uh, sleep together, uh, and and he's like, "What is that? Some sort of yoga thing?" And she's like, "No, it's a chance that increases conception." And he freaks out about it. And uh, well, there's a few things you need to know about about, about the dude. And her response is classic. She's like, I, "I don't even want the father to be someone I have to see socially." Or every time that she tries to send him to the doctor. Uh, his resp- uh, he's like, no, nah, it's okay. And she's like, you need to see him. He's a good man. And thorough. Yeah. Um, and then uh, we have, uh, I think, I can't remember the actor's name for the life of me, but he plays uh, Remus Lupin, I believe. Oh, David Thoris. In uh, Harry Potter. Yeah. And he also plays, uh, he's in Wonder Woman, as uh, I don't want to spoil anyone who hasn't seen Wonder Woman. I mean, it's not even in theaters at this point, but still, where I, I would imagine it's not in theaters at this point. I haven't looked today. Um, but, uh, but yeah, he plays in that as well, and he plays the uh, the video artist Knox Harrington, who, uh, like, he's like, oh, so you uh, ask Lebowski what's he do, does all this stuff, and then he uh, he's like, well, you can have a seat. He's like, cool, sits down. As, as the dude is sitting down, uh, he asks... Uh, Knox Harrington asks, like, if you want a drink? And he said, yeah, sure, I'll have a white Russian. And uh, he's like, the bar's over there. Just, it's that, it, I, in, in my everyday life, I get that feeling where I'm standing up and I go to sit down and be like, oh, could you do this for me? Or could you do this for yourself? Or blah, blah, um, And, uh, crud, I'm trying to think of some other stuff. Oh, my God, there's so many. Everything about this movie is quotable. Uh, the dude, uh, whenever uh, the dude and the stranger meet for the first time and they're talking, uh, that uh, he has the comment that, you know, 
I, I really dig your style, dude. Well, I really dig your style too, man. Hey, is there is there one thing do you have to use so many cuss words and the dude responds what the fuck are you talking about? Um, and uh, and it, it's more than just the quotation parts. There's scenes that are just these visually memorable scenes. They're like the visual representation of quotable scenes. Um, when the dude and Walter at the end of the movie, spoiler, Donnie dies. Um, but uh, when they're at Donnie's, for lack of a better term, funeral, uh, and what Walter starts is this beautiful like send off for Donnie. He moves into like commentary about going to be about Vietnam, people that died in Vietnam, and then throws the ash out and it just blows back in the dude's face. And there's this moment where they have they share this almost it's almost a beautiful moment where like all the rage of losing their friend like shoved to the forefront and the dude kind of blames it on Walter because everything's a travesty with you. Like what was all that shit about career or Vietnam and blah 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 and and they just end up, you know, fuck it, dude, let's go bowling. And, it always, and that's and that's what these quotes kind of, they, they go back to, is at the end of the day, the, the, a lot of the important scenes and lines, like when it reaches a climax of the scene, especially when it's between Walter and, and uh, the dude, they're just like, fuck it, dude, let's go bowling. <laughs> and I'm glad you, you segued perfectly into me there, because I just remembered one of the great characters from the bowling segment, which... It does show Walter's kind of passion for stuff. Like, he takes this bowling thing very seriously. But talk about iconic characters. Jesus, I think his name is. or G- the, the Jesus. The Jesus. He goes by the Jesus. Played by John Turturro of anyone else. Like, I had to take a moment and see if that actually was him. This guy is so freaking charismatic and so funny, but he's such a dick about it. And I was actually reading when I was looking up, there are consider it i think they're filming it now they're making a sequel focusing on his character which that's and that's kind of been in talks for like i've read that and heard about that for like the past four years now but i I don't know man it's hard to see a movie just about the jesus because he is as walter put it a pederast so um uh it would be it would be a very challenging film i would imagine um, but yeah, I had heard it. I had heard that for like three or four years that they're always in talks, or they're writing a script, or they're filming a sequel. But I also hear every year that like, oh, they're talking about a sequel in general to The Big Lebowski called The Little Lebowski. I'm like, look, you can't take what Sam Neill said at the very end of the movie and be like, that's what the sequel is going to be called. That's a dead giveaway that it's not real. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I think we're heading into the wrap up stage now. Uh, you know how you, you said that I put you on the spot before. Mm-mm. You're going to hate me for this, but I want you to imagine that I've never seen The Big Lebowski. So what are you going to tell me to get me to watch it right away? Um, well, The Big Lebowski is a fun, comedic, postmodern noir uh, set in 90s uh, L.A. because most of your best noir mystery stories are set in 90s L.A. or set in L.A. in general. Um even some of the best video games about mysteries and noir are set in L.A. But uh, it's it's a fun, charismatic romp that that approaches a mystery in a pretty interesting fashion and has just a bunch of memorable characters. And if you liked, oh man, any Coen Brothers film, but I'm going to go with like, oh brother, where art thou or Fargo. If you like either of those films, you'll love this movie. And I think that's a great note to end off of. Uh, Joe... I know it took us a while to get here, but thank you so much for coming on Movies and Me. So I want to know, where can the good people find you, and is there anything that you want to plug while you're here? Uh, well, you can find me at uh, Drake Masters on Twitter. Um, and my wife and I have a, uh, I guess we could call it a, a channel account now, called geek to my nerd It's geek underscore to underscore my underscore nerd. Uh, and there we've been we are starting to do like live streams of games and uh, we're, we're tweeting from there as well. And we have some more stuff in the works, something about Saturdays. That's where I'm, that's all I'm going to go with for now. Um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. You can also find me on a uh, tough channel or I also tweet about screen junkie stuff, typically on TV and movie fights. Yeah. Yeah. You've always got some really intriguing answers whenever it comes to movie fights or TV fights, but, uh, I think that'll do us for today. And uh, guys, as always, use the hashtag movies and me if you want to continue the conversation or leave us a comment below. Uh, we're 
big announcement. We're not going to have an episode next week because I'm getting ready to move back to Scotland so I can go back to college. And we're going to be continuing Movies and Me as soon as I can. But, uh, Joe, you're now the last episode before I go on a break. But you guys will not be without content because if you've been paying attention, you'll know I've been doing video essays for the past couple of weeks that have gotten pretty great responses so far. And that's really great. So... Keep an eye out on my Twitter and follow me at NolanDean27 to find out more info. Until then, if you like this episode, hit the subscribe button, and I will see you guys next time.